This epic shootout was brought to you by Maven ND Filters. My 6 and 10 stop filters are specifically designed for unsurpassed color neutrality, even against the big boys. Be sure to subscribe to see the head-to-head -head tests coming soon. Back in November of 2018, I did a sports focusing test between the Sony a7 III and the Fuji X-T3, and I made very specific recommendations to both manufacturers regarding their focusing algorithms. Shortly thereafter, both companies announced updates to their firmware addressing focusing, and they also announced that those firmwares would come out first in the A6400 and then in the Fuji X-T3 before they were given to their bigger brothers. I'm one of the last YouTube photographers who does hardcore sports focusing tests, and I've received many questions in terms of how the focusing has improved when these two guys go head to head. At the time of this recording, they both cost about $900. We have a 24 megapixel sensor on the Sony. We have a 26 megapixel X-Trans sensor on the Fuji X-T30. The Sony has a unique front facing monitor, which is really great for shooting vlogs or selfies, things of that nature. And it comes loaded with a number of incredible features such as 11 frames per second, incredible focusing systems that has been touted all over YouTube as the very best at the time of this recording. But make no mistake, we have 99% coverage on the X-T30 with also amazing focusing systems. Many of you have asked about the lenses that I use in these tests. For the sports shooting, I use the Fuji 50 to 140 2.8 and the Sony 70 to 200 2.8 G Master. The rest of the tests were performed with the Fuji 16 to 55 2.8 XF Pro and Sony's 24 to 70 2.8 G Master. Both cameras have built-in flash, Wi-Fi, almost all the bells and whistles you could think of. They both shoot at 120 frames per second. They both will do 4K video recording over sampled, which makes the video look sharper and crisper. So the question I always ask, these specs on paper look great, but when it comes down to the actual tests, this is where my videos stand out. I like to test cameras before I give my recommendations. This isn't a promotional video. I don't go to the, you know, the press events. I'm not trying to sell you a camera. I'm trying to help you to determine the strengths and weaknesses in terms of how they compete head to head. If you find this video helpful and you end up getting one of these cameras, I have free tutorials for both of them on YouTube. Check them out. They're almost two hours long, both of them, and they will get you started. And if you enjoy those videos, I have advanced courses as well for both of them. The first test we want to do is we want to go down to the park and do the sports focusing test. It takes a couple hours, but I'm really excited to see how the focusing systems have changed. In the sports shooting test, I'm using continuous focus at the high speed burst with a release priority for both cameras. I also pick a large single focusing square and I typically put it on the far left or far right of the viewfinder. For side-to-side -side motion of a moving subject in good light, both cameras scored a perfect 100%. For forward motion into good light while zooming out, again, both cameras did very well, with the X-T30 scoring 88% and the A6400 scoring 80%. Nearly all of the misses with the A6400 occurred closer to the subject as she approached the camera, and nearly all the missed X-T30 shots were slightly front-focused. The next test has always been the defining test. I have a subject, in this case, wearing a low contrast outfit, running into heavy backlight while zooming in. As I demonstrated in my last focusing tests, I call this the elbow problem test now because of how the runner's elbow throws the focusing systems off as she's running away. And I am aiming at the mid torso. Literally any part of the subject can be in focus in order for this to count as a hit. The X-T30 absolutely crushed this, hitting 117 out of 121 images for a 97% accuracy. This is similar to what we saw in the X-T3 test, and unfortunately, this is where the A6400 started running into some issues. Using a single focusing square on the far left while zooming in at 11 frames per second, the Sony only hit 29%. I decided to tweak a few variables to figure out what was going on in using a single focusing square on the far left without zooming in at 11 frames per second, the Sony improved to 67%. I decided to test Sony's tracking focusing square on the far left while zooming in at 11 frames per second and it improved again to 89%. Finally, I decided to 
turn the frames per second down to H instead of H plus. And I went back and measured, this works out to be about six frames per second while zooming in and the Sony improved to 95%. As I did in my last focusing test, I also want to measure how the face and eye detection on these camera systems are working in strong backlight. This is basically a new test. And something I can definitely say is that the Sony's face detection is more precise. I had our model Ashley stand at different distances, indicating the point when face detection kicked in. And on the side of the Sony, it was 25 to 35 feet further back at the same focal length. I measured it on a screen, looking at 1.5 millimeters on the Sony and about three millimeters on the Fuji. And then I would have her run towards me. Both cameras did very well. The X-T30 scoring 96 hits out of 105 for a 91% accuracy. And get this, the Sony with heavy backlight scored 266 out of 274 for a 97% face detection for sports focusing. That is astonishing. Both cameras do very well. There's a lot of good data here. And so some of the summaries I wanna make is to give you some information to come away from it. Both cameras definitely have dramatic improvements to their face detection. The Fuji seems to do better than the a6400 when we're talking about just using a single focusing square, which is a lot of what DSLR shooters are used to. They want to limit the area the camera is looking at. The a6400 has the rack zoom problem that we've seen on so many other Sony cameras when we're using a single focusing square, and we are able to resolve this when we go down to H instead of H plus, or if we start using the tracking focusing square, which has been updated recently. The Sony is definitely more precise for face detection, although the Fuji has had a dramatic improvement and you're only going to notice it if you're shooting from very far away. Zooming in or out with the Fuji X-T30 doesn't seem to have any limitations. A camera's buffer performance is how many shots a camera can take in a high-speed burst before it starts to slow down. There are a number of variables that play into this, from the frames per second of the camera itself, to the file size, the memory card, all of these things come into play. I'm using a really fast SanDisk UHS-2 card. I'm going to use the same exact card in both cameras. We're going to, going to start off with the A6400, and we're going to go raw first, and then we'll try the JPEG. We are on 11 frames per second, it's in manual mode. And I just want you guys to watch the buffer light to see how long it takes for it to clear. I'm going to push and hold the shutter button down until it starts to slow, and then we'll watch and see how long it takes the buffer memory to clear out. There it is. So we have this indicator, it looked like about 40 shots. You can re-engage while it's clearing, but it looks like when we get about 40 raw images waiting to be written is when it slows down. It's doing a pretty nice job of it. Great, and then we can re-engage. So now let's come into the menu and let's go to JPEG only. And this is a slightly different test simply because JPEG images are a lot smaller. I wanna see if we can get more shots before the buffer slows down. We're gonna to go to a fine quality. It's not the best quality, it's not the worst quality, but we'll do the medium quality on both. As a side note, the raw format on the A6400 is a compressed raw file. But let's take a look at this JPEG. Ready, one, two. There it goes, starting to slow down. So the buffer held about 80. Seems to be going pretty quick. But something you're going to notice when you compare the, this to the X-T30 is the X-T30 is very fast with JPEGs. But you'll notice that it takes a little bit of time for the JPEGs to clear. Look at the total number of shots remaining. Pretty good performance. So no problem shooting 80 or more images. And in most cases, the truth of the matter is you're not going to shoot 80 images in a row like that. 
It's usually in bursts of 10 or 20, even for sport shooting. So now let's repeat these tests with the X-T30. Again, same camera settings, we're in the manual mode. We're on a continuous high burst with autofocus continuous for the image quality, it's raw only. And we have a little buffer light that is writing to the memory card. We see it right here. Let's just take a look. Count of three, one, two. So pretty quick. So for raw images, it takes a while to clear the memory card. And my thought on this is that the X-T30 is really not a great camera for shooting high frames per second with RAW. That's not a rip on the camera, it's just there's strengths and weaknesses to every camera. But remember, that was uncompressed RAW. Those are larger file sizes, so we're gonna come into our RAW settings and we're gonna turn this to lossless compressed. See how fast the buffer cleared? If you're shooting lossless compressed, which is what I would recommend if you have to shoot a high-speed burst with raw files, they're smaller, they're gonna write faster. Let's take a look at JPEG, normal setting. So not the highest quality, but the regular setting. And so this is JPEG. Let's take a look in, in terms of how it does for the JPEG normal images. Count of three, one, two. I'm going to give up here in a second. <laughs> so we can see pretty much hundreds. Did you see how fast the memory card cleared? Completely different ball game in terms of what we're getting in terms of performance for JPEGs. So almost instantaneous clearing, you know, within a split second or two. I believe the reason why this is happening is because number one, those file sizes are a little bit smaller than RAW, obviously, but the quad-core processors are converting them much faster than the Sony. So I think the Sony has really deep buffer, but I also think its processors are a little slow in converting JPEGs. I think the Fuji strength is in the processing power. We saw it in the focusing test. We're also seeing it in the conversion of the JPEGs. One advantage the Sony has over the Fuji for video focusing is the precision of face detection. It's quite hard to appreciate how small that box is, which is going to make vlogging or recording for presentations an absolute dream with the A6400. That said, the X-T30 isn't that far behind. The motion of the face detection is quite good in both cameras. I would even go so far as to say the X-T30 feels a little faster and snappier, but in all honesty, I don't think most users are going to notice a difference. Two side notes, the A6400 has a definite advantage if you are looking for a general autofocus cluster in video mode. It seems the X-T30 struggles a little bit on the periphery with its multi-mode cluster for video unless your subject is more centered. So I'm almost always shooting with the area cluster which does better. On the other hand, the X-T30, like the X-T3, has a spectacular focusing advantage over the A6400 and that is high speed face detection. Paired with the 16 to 55 2.8, it's the best I've seen in any camera with the 1DX Mark II being the only one that comes close. It is seriously a game changer. If you have not seen it in action, this is something filmmakers should definitely take note of. 120 frames per second with face tracking. If you need a tricky slow motion hero shot that you want to nail on the first time trying, take a look at the X-T30 or the X-T3. In my low light focusing test, I picked two targets, one at an exposure value of 6.0 and the other at negative 1.8, and I focus back and forth 30 times recording how long it takes to go through the set. I repeat this three times and take an average. The A6400 averaged 62.5 seconds, and the X-T30 averaged a blistering 39.6 seconds. 
It's one of the fastest scores of all time in this test. No contest here for low light focusing. The XT30 absolutely dominates. For my dynamic range test, I fire a strobe through a Stouffer wedge, which is essentially 41 little ND filters at one third stop increments or about 13.7 stops of total dynamic range. I overexpose the first part of the strip to calibrate and analyze using Adobe Camera Raw. I'm basically looking for the last interval that has a distinct and complete border. The full methodology is outlined on my blog. In terms of dynamic range only, both cameras do very well at ISO 100 with a score of about 37 or 38. It's pretty comparable. At an ISO of 1600, the A6400 is closer to 29 or 30 with higher color noise. At 1600 for the X-T30, it seems higher between 31 and 32. Not as much color noise as we see in the A6400. For the dynamic range test, I give a slight advantage to the X-T30. And I need to give you some important side notes. As on all Sony cameras, with compressed RAW, we continue to see this artifact called posterization, which are these little blocks of compression we see around areas of high contrast. The interesting thing to me is that these blocks are usually dark green on all the other Sony cameras I've tested, and on the A6400, they appear black. I wonder if Sony is attempting to resolve or at least mask it. Also important to note, the A6400 only comes with compressed RAW, and this is something that we do not see in uncompressed RAW Sony files that have it, but suffice it to say, this shouldn't be your first choice when shooting astrophotography. Many of you who shoot a lot of RAWs would be happy to know that the X-T30 has both uncompressed and lossless compressed RAW options. For my ISO chart tests, I take pictures in both RAW and JPEGs of a color chart and analyze using Adobe Camera Raw. Something to note, you will get very different results with the Fuji RAW files depending on the RAW engine you're using. And at lower scores, it's going to be harder to notice significant differences. When we were talking about JPEG stills at very high ISOs, I give a slight advantage to the Sony. It appears a touch sharper, and the Fuji appears to be softening the image, as you can see in these tick marks and numbers. On the raw side, Sony's noise patterns appear to be more granular and natural, whereas the Fuji's appears more worm-like. I can't really say if one is better than the other. Just be aware, at very high ISOs, you can expect to see this. Moray is a splotchy artifact that sometimes appears in certain patterns, like this horizontally lined shirt. Both cameras exhibit moray, and YouTube compression hides a lot of this. So you're going to see it a little bit differently than I do, but that's kind of good in a way. But if I was to say one were better than the other, I think the X-T30 has a slight advantage here, but not much. Analyzing high ISO noise performance with a candle in a dark room, I tested both cameras side by side at ISO 3200, 6400, 12,800, and 25,600. And what I saw was that the Fuji does very well, but it appears to be overcompensating by crushing the blacks. And again, Fuji has this tendency to under rate their ISO, which underexposes everything. But if you're looking at the detail of the candle itself, we get far more in the Sony. When we take a look at ISO performance in brighter conditions, however, using a handsome model, the same exact camera settings, it's easier to see this underexposure that Fuji is using. However, look at the grain in the A6400 and compare it with the Fuji. It gets worse as the ISOs increase. Compare the differences and ask yourself where you would draw the line for each. To me, the Fuji is clearly better for high ISO noise performance, even though it crushes its black. And so for overall noise performance, I give the win to the Fuji. Rolling shutter is a jello-like effect when panning the camera left to right. In the case of this vertical light stand, you can see how it appears to be tilted or bent when I do this. The Sony appears to have a higher degree of rolling shutter, but not by much. And you can expect to see this on most video cameras that do not use global shutter. I would probably call this close enough to a tie. Sony Alpha cameras are notorious for overheating, and I have overheated all of the Sony Alpha cameras that I have owned. Using a forward-looking infrared radar, 
I mapped where the cameras get hot and measured their maximum temperatures after 20 minutes of video recording. As predicted, the Sony registered between 103 and 104 degrees Fahrenheit on the right side of the monitor. No surprises here. When I measured the heat of the X-T30, however, I was shocked to see the heat score in the 136 degree Fahrenheit range. This is simply ridiculous, and I believe it exposes the real reason for the limited 10-minute recording on the X-T30. I believe that in the smaller body space compared to the X-T3, the X-T30 is having a harder time cooling off, and therefore Fuji has introduced an, an auto shutoff to help minimize this. When we take this 10-minute limit into consideration compared to the Sony, on the other hand, that has unlimited video recording, this is a significant and serious reason you may want to consider going with the A6400. If you do a lot of videos and they tend to be longer, it's a no-brainer. Grab a pen and a piece of paper and list it from 1 to 13 and write down which image you prefer, either the left image A or the right image B more. Don't think about it too long, just write down your first initial impression when taking a glance. Pause the video if you need extra time. I am going to show you a series of images taken in the same conditions with the same white balance at the same equivalent focal length of either camera. I had to make some adjustments to the exposure because Fuji tends to underexpose by one third to one half stop and I wanted the images to appear exposed as evenly as possible as to not give you a clue which camera it came from. This is the color science test. There are no right or wrong answers. It is simply a matter of helping you determine which camera you prefer more in terms of colors and the appearance of the image. This is going to be your personal opinion, so don't worry if your answers don't match up with others. So, are you ready for the answers? Here they are. If you get a score that is mostly even, this suggests that both cameras are good enough to you that color science really won't make a huge difference, especially in regards to flesh tones. If you do get one score which is much higher than the other, it suggests that you do have a preference for the color performance of that specific camera. When we're talking about the major strengths and weaknesses between each of these cameras, I like to ask myself, what can this camera do that no other camera can do? Or what can this camera do better than the other? We have to give credit to the front facing monitor on the Sony. Obviously the major problem with this is it's right in front of the hot shoe and you're going to need a microphone if you are a vlogger. So I absolutely recommend an offset cold shoe adapter. There's a number of companies that make them. I make a really simple, easy one. I sell these on my website. If you want to check them out. I definitely believe the placement for the microphone should be on the right side versus the left just for balance reasons. When you put it over here it tends to kind of fall more this way. Other notable advantages are the focusing systems. There is an algorithm war going on right now between Sony and Fuji. I made that focusing video and it's definitely been improved. The face detection is really precise. Eye detection is really precise. The tracking is amazing. You have 11 frames per second mechanical. So those are all important considerations. Another thing I love about it is the unlimited video recording. With the picture profiles, we have tons of ways to tweak. We have S-logs, things of that nature. So it's 
loaded for video shooters. It just depends on what kind of video shooting you're doing. I think the grip is definitely better in terms of the actual ability to hang on to it. There are some other really great features about this. And the thing that bugs me the most about it is the battery. If you're going to be doing any kind of shooting, especially video recording, you're probably going to need to buy anywhere from three to four extra batteries, you know, for a day of shooting, no problem. We were shooting the other day for just a half an hour and we, we went through almost half a battery. So keep that in mind. Fuji and Sony, if you're listening, please, 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 for the love of all things good, make the deep menu systems accessible using the touch monitor. It would greatly improve the usability of the menu systems. Right now we have to use the joysticks to kind of go through them. I'm not a huge fan of that. When we're talking about the major strengths of the X-T30, there are a couple things that really come to mind. The first is usability. For whatever reason, I enjoy shooting the X-T30 more. I feel like I'm having a more enjoyable experience for, and I can't explain it. I think it's a cooler looking camera, but in terms of measurable differences that you will definitely notice is that if you're going to go for high-end glass on the X-T30, it is going to be far more affordable. Remember, Fuji lenses are designed for APS-C size formats, and I think that has a lot to do with the cost. Take, for example, sport shooting. If you want to get a 100 to 400 zoom lens on either of these cameras, far more affordable on the Fuji. I just bought one for less than $1,500. It was on sale. If you're going to try to get the equivalent on the Sony, you're looking at $2,600. If you're looking at the 70 to 200 or the equivalent would be the 50 to 140, same thing. It's far more affordable on the Fuji. And if you're going for an equivalent 24 to 72.8 on the Fuji, they were just on sale recently for less than $1,000. The 24 to 72.8 G Master is well over $2,000. So that cost is ecosystem over the long run, if you're going to get those higher end lenses, we're talking top of the line lenses for each camera, there's a huge cost advantage to the X-T30. That's something that really stands out. Now the focusing systems, they are outstanding on the X-T30, both for video and sports shooting as we demonstrated. The face detection, it can still become a little bit more precise, I believe, but when we're talking about the ins and outs of shootings, there are some advantages that the X-T30 has, specifically in the electronic shutter mode. We can shoot 20 or 30 frames per second. We have pre-shot focus, which allows us to high frame rate buffer images before the fact, before we actually push the shutter button down. It's a really cool feature. We have a maximum shutter speed of 1 32 thousandth of a second. So in terms of sports shooting, you're going to have to pick your preference. When we're talking about the video shooting features, you know, for many reasons, people will say, yeah, the A6400 is better. However, if you are behind the camera and you're not doing as much vlogging, there are some very specific reasons the X-T30 has some outstanding options for videographers. Talking about 10-bit 422 external, so if you're going to do color grading, I believe the Fuji has the advantage. It has higher bit rate, 200 megabits per second. We have the ability to plug in a headphone jack through the remote port. When we're talking about our raw file options, they're way better on the Fuji. We have lossless compressed as well as complete uncompressed where we only have compressed raw files on the Sony. I like the dynamic range coming out of the Sony, but we have those artifacts and we're kind of stuck with them just because we don't have any other options. I like the options on the Fuji a little bit more. This may not seem like a big deal, but the kit lens, I like the quality of this 18 to 55 a little bit more. It's a little bit sharper. It can go down to 2.8 at certain focal lengths. I like the size and the compactness of this kit lens. I mean, you can literally put this in a pocket and it'll fit. So again, there's give and take. When we're talking about the weaknesses of the X-T30, it's the 10 minute video record limit. 10 minutes is so short, I find myself frustrated with it. The Q button, I believe is a limit. It's right here on top of the tension control grip. The grip is great, but I tend to bump this. So we need the ability to have a double tap instead of just a single tap that activates it. But other than that, it's a great little camera. It's super small and compact. I love the X-T30. I love the look of it. It's really, really great. If I were to make a recommendation for portrait photographers, I would say take a look at the results you got from the portrait color science test. I think that's going to be the most important factor. I do think the eye detection is a little bit more precise on the A6400, but absolutely capable, amazing on the X-T30 as well. I actually own both of them and I wanna keep both of them for different reasons. I wanna keep my A6400 for vlogging and quick video setups, and I wanna keep my Fuji X-T30 as a very small, 
sport shooting camera because I have that 100 to 400 and I go out and shoot a lot. Congratulations if you get either one of these cameras. If you're struggling to learn them, check out my free tutorials on YouTube. I also have high-end advanced courses for both of them and I will show you everything you want to know about your camera. Thank you guys so much for watching. I would love to hear your comments below and I will see you next time.